Рада вітати вас на конференції UTIC, Dear Auditory and Dear Online Auditory, I am glad and very welcome you on a UTIC, UTIC conference in the stream localization and translation technologies. And uh, I would like to uh, represent our the first speaker, Mr. Kimo Rossi. He is uh, from European Commission. He is right now working for DG Connect uh, G3 uh, unit. And uh, I think that this presentation will be very useful for everyone here, for our colleagues from Ukraine and Russia especially, because uh, European Commission, they do a lot of work related to the research, and they are always very uh, welcome uh, the new uh, organization who can make research as well. So more will tell Kimo Rossi, but before this, I just would like to thank uh, for the Logros, because they are sponsor of this track. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Yelena. <laughs> Thank you for presenting uh, me. And uh, I want to special, uh, reach my special thanks to the organizers. Uh, it's a pleasure and honor to be here in Kiev. Uh, so far, I liked everything uh, here. Uh, it's a wonderful place, uh, and it's really interesting to be here. Uh, so thank you. Uh, as uh, Renato Beninato said in this uh, introducing, uh, in this official video of the last event, that uh, it's very difficult to organize something for the first time. And I know that it's very difficult for you now was to organize it for the second time as well. And uh, I appreciate uh, the efforts of the organizers and thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, language technology mostly. Uh, I don't know uh, what is your level of knowledge of language or translation technology. Uh, so I had to make some assumptions. Uh, uh, if you feel during my presentation that uh, you don't understand something or that uh, you need some explanation to, so, so that it's uh, perfectly okay that you stand up and interrupt me and say, okay, what does this mean? What does this acronym mean? Or what, what are you talking about? Uh, so uh, don't hesitate uh, to interrupt if there's necessity to do so. So I will explain these cryptical uh, uh, things that you see on the first uh, slide first, because I think, uh, but before that, before I do that, I just explain a few words who I am and uh, what I have done before. And so why am I here? Why am I doing the things that, that I do? I don't necessarily know the answer, but uh, here is some background anyway. So uh, I started somewhere in the Stone Age, in the 80s, working in localization. Back then we called it technical translation because the word localization was not yet in a, in a wide use. Uh, but having followed this industry for quite a long time now, I can say that very little has changed. Very little has changed uh, in, in such a long time, in uh, 20, 25 years. In, uh, I can tell you that in 1980s, when I was a, a freelance translator for localization, software localization, we were already using machine translation and translation memory systems. There was no TRADOS yet, but there was something called IBM TM-2, the translation manager of IBM that we were using. We were wasting a lot of time with these tools. So it took us twice as long to translate anything with these tools. Uh, but we were, it was very exciting to use the tools, so that's why we were gladly wasting our time. Uh, things have, of course, changed a lot uh, uh, with, with the tools. So in 1989, I got my, uh, I sta started a real job, a more steady job. Uh, that's the, uh, the year when I graduated. Uh, and I, I worked, uh, in uh, this localization company, Trantex, which still exists, but of course the name have ch has changed a couple of times, and now it's called Lionbridge, Finland. Uh, so then 1994, I decided uh, to become a bureaucrat. 
Uh, so I joined, uh, it was an exciting period when Finland, my country Finland was joining the EU or there was a referendum in 1994 and the European Commission started a, um, uh, they set up a representation in, in, in Helsinki to prepare uh, the accession of Finland to the EU. And I was doing all kinds of things uh, there, uh, like uh, verifying uh, the correctness of the translations of the EU legislation into Finnish. So exciting, really exciting things. Uh, then uh, in 1995, uh, uh, I more permanently joined uh, the European Commission, uh, the translation service, as we sp it was called back then. Now it's called DG Translation. Um, so I was in the translation department, but I didn't tr actually translate much. I avoided translating something because I had traumatic experience of translation. I, I even translated a book once in Finland. It didn't sell very well. So I decided that I, I like the translation business, but maybe it's better that I don't translate myself. So then uh, in 2000, I... I moved a bit away from the translation service, but not too far, because uh, from 2000 onwards I was working uh, uh, in uh, technology projects uh, dealing with uh, language technology. Uh, so not directly with translation anymore, but trying to make translation easier. So this is uh, just, I, I will not go into what is in the boxes. You don't need to know, you don't want to know. Uh, I'm just uh, telling you that my workplace is not in Brussels, because people usually think that uh, European officials are all in Brussels. We have a team, we have this directorate G Media and Data located in Luxembourg, and that's why I have a picture of a nice bridge called Pont Adolf, which was the high tech uh, more than one year, more than 100 years ago, was was a piece of uh, uh, engineering uh, that everybody uh, was um, admiring at the time. Uh, so now to the unit uh, where I I work. So uh, our team about 35 people. Uh, we do basically three different things. We work on uh, language technology, uh, information management, uh, and public sector information. I will talk now here mostly about the first bullet point here because it doesn't, uh, it's not necessary to go into detail of the other um, activities of our unit. But we do other things. We do big data, open data, uh, uh, text analytics as well. But basically, we are among other things, a funding agency for technology projects. So research projects and innovation projects. And the important thing I want to emphasize here that we do not fund technology for the sake of technology or uh, actually it's impossible to fund technology. We fund the work of bright people and that's why I want to underline, emphasize that we have like 1,500 1, people full-time equivalents working in our projects. Uh, since not all of them actually are full-time workers, we have even more people than that, maybe three, four thousand people working in our projects. And it's thanks to these people, uh, their uh, passion, their dedication and their talent that, that we have some good results from these uh, technology projects. So we have, we manage a portfolio of about 130 uh, technology projects. We don't do any of the uh, exciting things that I'm talking about ourselves. We are following these projects, uh, and, uh, but we get to know about the results and also about the problems, of course, if, if there are any. Now, I take a small detour now to talk about something else, not my units, my uh, team's uh, tasks, but this is about the language and translation services of the European Union in general, because some of you might be interested, either there are professional translators and interpreters who may uh, want to know what the EU is doing. It's actually, uh, the European Union has the largest translation services in the world. There is nothing that is bigger than that. So, uh, 
the EU employs about 7,000 uh, translators, uh, uh, if you count also the, the support staff in the translation uh, units. And on top of that, there are thousands of freelancers. Uh, I will not give you uh, any tutorial of uh, the, the institution, what are the European institutions. Uh, I can just tell that the, there are uh, the, the Commission, the European Parliament, and the Court of Justice, and the, uh, and the Council uh, are the four institutions that have the largest amount of uh, uh, language uh, uh, workers, language professionals. Uh, so there are about 1,000 interpreters working for the European institutions, plus thousands of freelancers. Uh, we spend about 1 billion euro, so 1,000 million euro a year for uh, translation, on translation and interpretation. Uh, these two links are there for those who want to have more information of uh, the job opportunities if you want to work as a freelancer uh, for the European uh, Union, uh, either as translator or interpreter. It's possible for individuals, individual freelancers and for companies. But since I'm not in that department, uh, I just refer to these uh, links. Everything that we do is driven by a policy. So policy is the word that gives us the reason to do something, the reason to spend money on something. We do nothing without a policy. The European Union has hundreds of different policies uh, that are, they may have to do with public health or, or uh, uh, job creation or uh, economic growth policy. I'm going to talk to you about two policies that are relevant for our action activities. First of all, the EU multilingualism policy there, uh, um, is, uh, is a cornerstone of the European Union. Uh, we can say it's, it's a cornerstone because it was uh, already a legal obligation from the very first day that the European uh, uh, Union was started in the 1950s, uh, that all the languages uh, are equal. So all the EU official languages are equal. Uh, from this, it follows that uh, we promote linguistic diversity uh, rather than, uh, than having one single lingua franca, because first of all, it would be impossible to agree on what that lingua franca would be. And it's also because uh, it is not realistic to have all the 500 million Europeans to learn that uh, lingua franca. <laughs> so we promote multilingualism also to, uh, uh, to promote uh, intercultural exchanges, so that people can exchange ideas uh, despite the language barrier. And we also promote the translator's profession and education. Uh, my college, colleagues in the DG translation uh, have special programs on that. Uh, and then more in our portfolio is to promote business opportunities that arise from multilingualism. So you know very well that you can do money with multilingualism, but many companies see it only as a cost. So we concentrate on finding uh, the advantages uh, of multilingualism. <coughs> Another policy, so that was one policy. Another policy that is driving our activities and uh, <coughs> uh, justifying our actions and our, uh, spend why we spend taxpayers' money is the digital single market. So our politicians from the EU member states have decided that it, it is beneficial to have a single market uh, in the whole EU uh, across the uh, 28 countries so that goods and services and information and capital move freely between all the EU countries. Uh, the, European, the, the size of the market of EU is twice the size of the, the US market uh, in terms of inhabitants. We have 500 million consumers in Europe, but the problem is that they speak 60 or more different languages. And out of these 60, there are 24 official EU languages. 
Uh, now I go back to the 50s when the EU was, or the European uh, communities uh, was set up. There were only four official languages, French, German, Italian and Dutch. Four official languages and English was not one of them. Uh, now uh, in the successive enlargements of the EU, uh, the, the number of languages has now uh, reached uh, 24. But in reality we have to actually cover about 30 languages because we have associated countries in our programs. So in many situations we also have to cover languages like Norwegian uh, and uh, Icelandic, uh, Serbian, Turkish. So we have many languages and the, the number of official language, languages is constantly growing. Now that is a problem for a, a, a single market uh, where which more and more operates online. Uh, so more and more we buy uh, uh, things online, we buy services, uh, uh, flights, uh, hotel stays uh, and uh, commodities, goods and services, even groceries we buy online. But only a small fraction of the European e-commerce websites are multilingual. We have 80% are in one language only. So the uh, Polish uh, website uh, where you can buy things uh, is in Polish only. And if you don't understand Polish, well, you cannot really use that uh, website for buying. So we have serious barriers, language barriers uh, for the digital uh, single market. And English, you might think that let's just all use English, but we have done some surveys about the proficiency level of English and uh, we have less than half of the Europeans that know any English. And then if uh, you ask people to do some online transactions with their credit cards, only about 10% uh, of the EU citizens want to use English for th th that kind of uh, scary operations. Uh, so, uh, it is uh, a reality that we have a multilingual uh, market and that we cannot, uh, very often we cannot uh, uh, bridge these language barriers by tradi traditional translations because the uh, content that needs to be translated changes all the time and there is too much of it for, for translators to handle. So, we don't have enough translators to translate it all. So, we try to address these uh, issues uh, with uh, three instruments, three tools. Um, we uh, can uh, issue regulations, laws, uh, for example, to make governments do something. To, for example, make data available for everybody. Uh, we can set up infrastructure, so we can promote creation of a sharing platform for language resources, for corpora, for translation memories. And we have done that. Uh, and then we can support uh, research and innovation uh, projects on language technology to improve uh, translation um, uh, quality and uh, also productivity. To help translators translate more uh, and in better quality. So I will not go into the details of the different programs that we have, but uh, <coughs> I just briefly explain how it works, how our uh, the portfolio of 130 projects, how did they come into existence? What, what did they have to do? Uh, so um, everything is based on uh, open competitive calls. You have to send your application uh, when there is an open call. Uh, so, uh, and then from time to time uh, we organize evaluations to evaluate uh, all these hundreds or thousands of proposals that we receive. And the best pro proposals uh, are then given uh, what is called a grant agreement. So we sign an agreement uh, and the proposal becomes a project. So that's when the life, life uh, starts. Uh, so the projects are implemented not by a single uh, partner, but by a consortium of several partners. Typically, 
from uh, five to eight partners, but there can be as many as 40 or 50 partners in a project, depending of the type of the project. Now, the projects are autonomous. It's different from public procurement. We also do pro public procurement to buy something, buy services, but these are, this is not uh, buying services. We give the projects full autonomy and freedom uh, in using their results. They own their own results and the intellectual rights to their results. But we do have some requirements of uh, publicity and that they produce something which is of uh, public good and, and, and uh, can be used uh, by citizens and, and companies for some useful purpose. So typically open data, open source publications, training material. But first of all, we expect the participants of a project to make money with what they do. That's not forbidden. It's actually uh, um, encouraged that uh, they make, it's, it's a success criteria that they make uh, money with the project. So we have, uh, broadly speaking, three uh, types of uh, projects. Uh, research project to develop new methods and technologies. We, I often say that uh, we give uh, money to researchers to do something that doesn't work yet, but that we hope that will work after five years. Second category, innovation, is something that we know that the technology works, but not many companies are using it because it's complicated or it requires a high initial investment. So that's the innovation project. We try to lower the threshold of uh, making use of modern technologies. Then we have a third type of project which are, can, be, can be qualified as support and infrastructure projects. So facilitating networking, uh, coordination, organizing events and campaigns. That's also very important. It's important to bring people and ideas together. Now, before I use too much of my time, I want to give you just a, an overview of some of the projects we have in our uh, portfolio. I cannot possibly tell you uh, uh, about all the 100 plus projects that we have, but I picked some with, with links, uh, I picked some projects that might uh, be of interest uh, to you. Um, so LT Innovate is uh, a support project, so it's of this third category of projects, so bringing people together. They organize events of the European language industry and their next event is scheduled in uh, Brussels uh, at the end of um, uh, June. Uh, so I welcome you to join that event. Uh, you will find information on, on their website. Falcon. Uh, uh, I specifically took up Falcon because uh, it's uh, works on a, on a novel concept of translation memory. So many of you know the idea of translation memory that you have it typically uh, stored on your computer, but actually you could treat the web as one uh, huge translation memory. Uh, if you just establish, establish the links between the segments, of course you have to say that this uh, sentence in English and this sentence in Ukrainian are translations of each other. If you do that on the web, so if you annotate web content like that, you can finally actually treat the web as one uh, huge translation memory. And that's what Falcon uh, is working on. It's, it's, let's say, an idea that will take a few years before we see results from that, but the idea is interesting. Now, TAS is a project, it means terminology as service, uh, and it's, it's a very practical project where if you need to do terminology extraction from documents, I invite you to uh, get in touch with this project TAS because it can do nice uh, uh, automatic extractions of terminology from large documents. I know that, of course, commercial tools like Trados also can do terminology extraction, but uh, TAS is a bit more um, uh, ambitious than that because uh, it, it will also, in this final uh, outcome, the final version, it will do bilingual extraction of uh, terminology. 
So you will have not only a list of ter terms, but you will have a list of terms and their translations if you give it uh, documents in, into uh, parallel, parallel documents in two languages. Uh, so this could be useful, uh, uh, very useful uh, for uh, translators and tra uh, localization companies. Now let's MT. I have a slide on that. Uh, and Matecat, I also have a slide on that. I have to tell something more about that. Then Moses Core uh, is a project that, um, uh, in, uh, that has the mission to uh, make, make it easier to use uh, machine translation. So for uh, people who don't have programming skills, uh, so to set up your own machine translation using uh, the open source uh, machine translation toolkit, uh, Moses. Moses has been rather uh, successful and widely adopted in the, uh, in, um, in the translation industry. But the problem has been that it uh, takes a lot of time and effort and trouble to get it working. So we are funding a project that uh, should make it, sh should create a wrapper that makes it easier uh, to build your own machine translation systems uh, using the Moses uh, toolkit. Okay, now before I go to the project Let's MT, uh, just uh, for the sake uh, of completeness and, uh, and uh, being on the safe side, just quickly say what statistical machine translation uh, means and how it works, because it's probably you are not all familiar with that con concept. So statistical machine translation is the type of machine translation that, for example, Google Translate is, is using. So that's the same technology. In order to create statistical machine translation engine, you, you need uh, large text in the source language and the translations in another language. It's called the parallel corpus. It's parallel because it has two languages in, in parallel. So the sentences in the original language and their translate, translations, good quality human translation. And then you need one corpus which is monolingual, which is uh, called uh, the, uh, it's, uh, the uh, target language corpus. So the, trans, uh, the, uh, the corpus in the language that you are translating into. And then you need a toolkit to create the uh, statistical machine translation system. And to run it, you need a relatively powerful uh, computer. So not just an ordinary small uh, laptop, but uh, a bit more um, powerful than that. And you need some programming skills to set it up. So it's a bit, in principle, it's a low cost operation, free, but it takes a lot of skills and time. So here is uh, the same in, in graphical uh, presentation. So you have here uh, the two the two halves of the parallel corpora. So you need, if you want to set up a Russian-Ukrainian uh, statistical machine translation system, you have to feed it with hope, uh, hopefully at least uh, one million sentence pairs that are translations of each other. Um, so then this black box called SMT learns uh, from these translations and learns to translate. But it also has to learn not only to translate what translates into what, it also needs to learn how to compose uh, uh, appropriate sentences in the target language, so in this case Ukrainian. So it needs a large corpus of uh, Ukrainian text in Ukrainian and from that it will automatically learn how to write Ukrainian. Now how that miracle happens uh, 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 it will take a long time to explain, and I'm not a good expert in that. And uh, actually, there are better experts here in the room uh, that can explain that. So I don't have uh, time uh, to, to, to go into that. But as a result, the system, in principle, will be able to translate sentences that it has never seen before. So sentences that do not exist here in this parallel corpus. Well, if they were, then it would be a translation memory system. And I'm not talking about translation memory system. This system is something that is able to combine the knowledge from the different sentences to translate totally new sentences. So this is the uh, uh, principle with how, how, how it works. So it looks very simple, but it is complicated in the sense that you need some programming skills and uh, 
you need some time to set up the, the system and feed the corpora. Uh, and this is a real problem for SMEs and for small companies, for uh, freelancers, they simply don't even want to try it. So that's why uh, uh, we supported the project Let's MT, which has finished already by now, and it's now turned into a commercial product uh, that allows you to do this thing uh, almost automatically. You just give, uh, you upload uh, these uh, corpora, these two corpora, the parallel and the monolingual, into the system, and it creates a machine translation system for you, which is customized for your text type. So if you are translating uh, manuals uh, for, for uh, refrigerators or car manuals, and you have uh, this corpora of text, then the system will be optimal for that particular purpose. Let's MT has this uh, philosophy of uh, it's, it, it is partly free it, and it's partly a paid service. You can use this Let's MT for free if, if you share your corpora. Uh, but if you want to uh, keep your corpora or your uh, translation memories to yourself, you can still use the Let's MT system, but then you have to pay a fee. So uh, that's uh, the uh, business strategy of how it's, um, uh, how it's, it's operated. So as I said, the project already ended two years ago, so now it's become autonomous, it has a life of its own, but I, I'm advertising it to you, give it a try. Uh, if you have large corpora, especially ones that you can share uh, with others, but even if you don't want to share, you can still use it, and, but then you have to pay um, a subscription. Another project that I will just uh, very briefly uh, outline is called uh, Matekat. It uh, actually arose from the, uh, from the eternal difficulty of uh, bridging the gap between machine translation and translation memory. Most translations today use translation memories. Uh, Trados or MemoQ and or Star and the like. And, uh, they are very good. You, you don't have to translate uh, the same sentence twice. But the problem, of course, with the translation memory systems is that they can only help you with what has already been translated. If you are faced with something new, they don't help you. But on the contrary, machine translation system can do exactly that. But they have other problems. They translate everything, that, but they make mistakes. And sometimes they make a lot of mistakes. And that's why most of you are not using. The people that I've been talking with here during the breaks don't use machine translation uh, for many purposes. And one of the, per uh, one of the reasons is uh, for not using it is that it makes too many mistakes and it does not learn. The next time it counters the same sentence, it makes the same mistake again. So um, why don't we combine uh, the, the assets of the two approaches and have a system that can translate any sentence and it will learn from the corrections, from your online corrections, like a translation memory system does. Now there have been some technical difficulties to, to make that happen uh, for machine translation because training the machine translation to make it change its behavior is you at least used to be very uh, difficult, very troublesome and resource intensive uh, uh, job to do for the computer I mean uh, it took like can take 24 hours of your computer time before uh, it, it happens but uh, the researcher in researchers in this Matricat project uh, there is for example the, the father of the Moses platform uh, Philip Kern is, uh, is in, involved in this project they managed to create a way of fast fast training of uh, machine translation that will overcome this problem and they have very uh, um, promising results. Now this project is still ongoing. You probably will have to give it some more time, maybe a year or so before it can be really in, in production use. But actually there is one translation company uh, uh, participating in this consortium. It's called translated.net. It's an Italian company and some of you may be working for them because they employ tens of thousands of freelancers. So they are already using this Matecat platform in, in their production.
Okay, I'm uh, reaching the end of my time slot, so I'll be quick now. I don't have much left. I just want to give you pointers to some useful uh, resources uh, that you may find useful in your work. First of all, have a look at the JRC Language Technology Resources Repository. JRC stands for Joint Research Center. It's part of the European Commission. It's a research center. They do really uh, uh, research. They are located in Ispra in Italy, and they have uh, done uh, terrific things for named entities. For example, uh, one of the uh, resources you will find uh, in that uh, uh, language technology resources uh, repository is something called JRC names. Uh, names of people in different languages, for example, names of places. Uh, you know it very well that it's it's uh, it's a challenge to not only to translate the rate but uh, but also to to know the, what is the the, uh, the equivalent of uh, the, um, proper names in different languages. So, for example, how do you spell Arseni Yatsenyuk in Spanish? Because you spell Arseni Yatsenyuk in ten different ways depending on which country you are in Europe. They have a database uh, with this different uh, translations in different countries for famous people uh, that they have collected it, them from online news, uh, from uh, multilingual online uh, news, because they are also uh, maintaining uh, something called the European Media Monitor uh, website, an automatic monitoring system for, for online news. So DGTTM is a translation memory of one billion words uh, in 20 three languages, so it's a real translation memory that you can use from day one and it works and you can upload it to your Trados system uh, if you are translating, especially if you are translating legislation between EU languages, uh, that's uh, something to, to use. And uh, uh, then we have other useful things, just visit the links, I will not uh, go into the detail, I just give now you the final uh, conclusion that why we depend we promote language independent technology that's perhaps the most important thing to say here ukraine ukraine and russian are not the official eu languages at least not yet uh, but the technologies that i have uh, presented here they they can support translation of any language not only the eu languages if you know about parallel corpora in ukrainian and russian and other european lang uh, languages let me know because I'm constantly hunting uh, such uh, uh, useful resources. Uh, so um, that would be very useful for our projects also to make uh, them uh, cover these languages better. Finally, here are my contact details. If you didn't have time, uh, uh, to get, if you didn't understand something, you can get in touch with me, uh, don't hesitate. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Kimo, for the presentation. And I hope that we have some questions in the auditory. Do we have? Uh, yes, please. Hi. Thank you very much for the presentation. Very interesting. My name is Matteo. I'm a freelance translator, project manager from Dubai. Um, actually, I was wondering about uh, the, since the machine translation is becoming so, um, I mean, is improving very fast, it's developing very fast, the quality is improving as well. I was wondering if uh, post editing will become also a subject in the academic uh, life and curriculum. So, are there any programs, training programs, or initiatives, even from the EU, uh, to support post editing training? Uh, that's a good question, and actually, the, about the education systems, I can say that very much depends on the language. If you are studying to be an English translator, translating into English, you will have in your curriculum post-editing, because uh, uh, translating into English, you will have to work with machine translation output. Another thing is about uh, the... Uh, uh, but for... Uh, if you want to be, uh, if you are studying in Finland to become a, a translator, translating into Finnish, you will not learn post-editing because uh, you will not be using uh, machine translation today. Things will change, of course. 
but I would say about post-editing that the systems that we are working on, uh, they, they gradually make this uh, difference between post-editing and, uh, and using a, 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 an online uh, translator's workbench, they make that dis uh, distinction disappear gradually. So uh, it is old-fashioned actually to take just the output of uh, machine translation and go through it sentence by sentence. Now the, the, the new systems will be interactive, so they will show you all kinds of color codes that what is the confidence level of this sentence where does this come from? Does this come from a translation memory so that it's reliable? Is it translated automatically with, with a high level of confidence? So with color code it uh, indicates you in different uh, shades of red the sentences that you should pay attention to. So it, is, uh, it is, will become more of the process that you are used to in using system like, like Trados uh, working online. So that's my the technology side of the answer to, to uh, uh, how I think uh, post-editing will develop. Felix, we uh, need to um, to complete uh, this session, but before this I have just one question which maybe will be interesting for most of the Ukrainian and, and Russian companies. Whether it is possible for companies from Russia and Ukraine to participate in European uh, Commission projects? Just briefly to say all, all the rest uh, will be maybe discussed with you personally already during the break thank, thank you. you that's a, a interesting question uh, i did not specifically advertise our funding programs now in this session because we don't have an open call at the moment uh, uh, ukrainian companies can participate in the eu uh, project consortia just as as uh, eu partners uh, and then we have a policy with the so-called BRIC countries, so the Brazil, uh, Russia, India, uh, and China, uh, that uh, they are considered to be wealthy enough to bring their own funding. So they can participate, but they should bring their own funding from their, uh, their national funding sources. So we have this kind of dual system in most of our programs, which is called the Horizon 2020, uh, the, the research and innovation program. Uh, but as I said, Ukrainian uh, companies are basically equally entitled to funded participation as, as uh, EU countries. But as I said, you need to have a consortium. In most project types need to have at least three uh, partners so that you cannot come with your company alone. You need to have partners from different EU countries. So we need to have at least from three, usually from three different EU countries, and then you may have uh, a third country. To put it very, very short and very simple. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Kimo, for coming here. So this is the end of this session. And a quick break, and we will start another one.